Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Hey, it's great to be with you. I am so excited to be with you again, yet another week, worshiping God, exalting Him, and bringing Him glory. And I really pray that's what uh, your desire, the desire of your heart is as well. Um, as we get started today, I just wanna share a couple things with you. Remember this Sunday, uh, from four to six, we're having our harvest party at the Normans. And so you should have received some information uh, about that via email, as well as some other things going on. Uh, but our harvest party, we're having a bunch of chili. We're having a chili cook-off too, and we have a coveted trophy to give out uh, for the one who wins the uh, chili cook-off. Uh, it's gonna be a great time, some kids games. We're gonna ro uh, roast hot dogs, um, have some cookies and stuff like that, as well as um, uh, chili and, and chips and things like that to go with them. Uh, so all you need to bring is a bag chair and some of the things that you'll see via the email. So please come uh, to the Normans. The address is there through email. Uh, if you don't have that, just pick up the phone, call Stacy or email her and we'll get that information to you. Um, also, uh, many of these things are on a little half sheet of paper called Save the Date. And so I just wanna, again, remind you of those things. Trunk or treat coming up. We need some people with cars. We really wanna uh, do this well back here in our parking lot. That's on um, October 31st, that's a Monday. Um, and I believe it's at five o'clock, I think is when we're doing it. I'm not sure about that, but again, that, that time will be in your email as well. And then we have a Thanksgiving event, Christmas coming up. We've got a lot of things coming up. So would you please just make sure you mark those dates on your calendar and just join us as we have a good time um, coming together with each other as well as reaching our community through some different uh, various events that we're, we're going to be having coming up. So please keep those in mind. Love to see you at the Harvest Party this Sunday again um, at between uh, or from four to six. Uh, so please, uh, please just plan to be there and just come and we'll have a great time. As we, uh, as we open up our time uh, with a call to worship, I just want to read, as, as usual, a passage of Scripture. And I love reading the last, what, 10 or so Psalms. Uh, they're, they're just so celebratory. And, and um, so I'm going to read Psalm 149 to you and listen to what it says. Hallelujah, sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel celebrate its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with the tambourine and the lyre. For Yahweh takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly celebrate in triumphal glory. Let them shout for joy on their beds. Let the exaltation of God be in their mouths and and a double-edged sword in their hands, inflicting vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, binding their kings with chains and their dignitaries with iron shackles, carrying out the judgment decreed against them. This honor is for all his godly people. Hallelujah. So as that, as that uh, it started off, it says, Hallelujah, sing to the Lord a new song. Bring praise, right? Um, let them praise his name with dancing and music um, because Yahweh takes pleasure in His people. And that's what we've been talking about. Yahweh is a very relational God. He loves us uh, with such unconditional love. I pray that today we would be able to bring Him glory and praise. So I would ask you, if you would, would you, why don't you stand and let's sing this song together and then we will get into the teaching of His Word. Great to be with you. Very excited. I hope you are anticipating encountering Yahweh today.
So how many of you know what a GPS is? Of course you know. We all know, right? Um, you know, nowadays they come pretty much uh, standard on our phones, right? GPS is a thing we can put our coordinates in. Coordinates in. We can put our the address in and it will map it out for us. What's really cool with certain GPSs, uh, we use one when we ride our motorcycles. We can actually uh, go into the settings and turn, turn some things off and, and tell it that uh, essentially that we're on a motorcycle and to stay off the main highways, uh, navigate us around some of the back highways, which is like what we like to ride if preferably if we can on trips. Um, on a motorcycle, no dirt roads, right? No bueno, no dirt roads. <laughs> so, but anyhow, you ever notice with a GPS, there are times uh, you, you, you follow it to a T and you're like, what? What in the world, man? Why did it take me this way? I don't know if you've had that before. I remember we were going, um, I can't remember where we were going. I think we were going to a U of M game, a uh, football game, and it literally, it was the weirdest thing. It, it just did, when I got into Ann Arbor, it just made me do this loop and then literally drop back on in on the road that I was coming up on. It was, it was just like a side it was like this side little loop for no reason whatsoever. And I come out and I'm like, well, that, this is the road I was just on. Why did it make me do this loop, you know? Um, and sometimes that's what GPSs do. Yeah, it's just odd, it's weird, you know? But uh, in other, most of the time they work flawless and um, some of them work in real time. So you know if there are some of those, uh, you know, make sure you're uh, complying with the laws of land and things like that. So anyhow, um, but, but most of us know what a GPS is. Today we're kind of talking about that in a sense. We're going to look at when Moses um, actually brought the, um, as, he, as he brought the Israelites, the Hebrews, uh, this group of people out of Egypt. Um, last week we talked about, you know, them uh, being in the, in, in the, in the uh, getting the commandments, you know, God was going to, or God, you know, them building a dwelling place for God, and then sin had to be taken care of, sin had to be atoned for, forgiven, uh, or dealt with, and then, and then we, uh, God was going to give them the Ten Commandments, and we saw where they just kind of, you know, again, this sin curse that's passed down from Adam, down through all generations, it raises its ugly head again and again and again, and we know that that's Satan trying to pervert uh, what God is wanting to do, and that is to bring the Messiah into this world. Again, we've said during this series of the story, 31 weeks, it points to Jesus. Clear back in Genesis, it points to Jesus. So all that we're doing continually points to Jesus and, and the, that He is the Messiah, that the Messiah is coming, the Savior is coming into this world, and that there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. The law is not going to fix it. Um, no matter how good we live is not going to fix it. There's only one thing that can fix it, and that is that we have a perfect sacrifice given to us by God Himself because of the sin nature gets passed down through the bloodline uh, with humans. And so we need someone that doesn't have the sin nature in them, the curse in them, the virus, whatever you want to call it, okay? And that's what this story is all about. So we pick up on this story uh, today. We pick back up on it. Um, there, you know, we just finished, uh, they, they, got, they received the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's a dwelling place, God, you know, that God's going to, they're going to, uh, uh, you know, the tabernacle that they're going to build for God specifically, very specific. God gave them the instructions for it. And so now comes the time where they actually come up to the land that was promised them some 645 years ago between God and Abraham. Uh, back in Genesis 12, when God said, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to take you to a land, right? And so, this is the land. And so Moses, God leads Moses and the people to this spot. And they're getting ready to go over into this land that's, that's flowing with milk and honey is how it's described. It's the land, the promised land, which means that's the land that God promised them. Um, and this is, the, this is where, this is the destination that God's wanting to take them. By the way, real quick, when we talk about this whole story for the 31 weeks, we're really on a journey. This whole thing is a journey from from, from Genesis to today, we are, we're on His journey, and God is trying to take us to the promised land. Every single one of us, okay? And so we, we read back here, you know, on, here on earth, you know, literally on earth, uh, there's this land that God said that I promised you, this is it. And so they arrive there, and it's time to go over. So you know what God says? God says, I want you to take a representative from each tribe, which would be 12, right? Representing the 12 sons of Jacob. So each one of his sons represents a tribe. Each one of their 
lineages and you know clans, tribes, however you want to describe that, make up uh, make up Israel. So you got twelve, the twelve, you got twelve sons. Twelve tribes are represented out of those twelve sons. Now, once we get into it, there's uh, we don't have time to teach on this because there's a couple other sons in there that that. Uh, but nevertheless. Uh, there's 12 tribes. I don't want to get confused here, but there's 12 tribes of Israel. So God says, I want you to take one representative, one person that's going to represent that tribe, and I want them to go into the promised land and scout it out. Because remember, there's other people living there right now. Okay? So that's what they do. So it's kind of this big road trip, right? They're in a car, you know, it's like, okay, we've arrived to our destination. And God says, well, we've almost arrived to our destination because God says, now it's time uh, to take a left-hand turn and to go, you know, the GPS, the God positioning system is saying, now it's time to take a left turn, go into the land of Canaan, go into the promised land and take it. It's yours. I've, I'm doing this, you know, it's yours. And we're going to see how that played out. And hopefully you read, you know, in your reading, you picked up on some of this. So that's what they do. They come, they get to the land of Barnea uh, or uh, Kadesh Barnea. And Moses takes one representative of each of the tribes. And this is what God said in Numbers, Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. He said, uh, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So one representative of each tribe. But he's saying, I want you to go into the land that I am giving to you. So that's what they do. They take 12 of these leaders. They take 12 that represents the tribes. They take them. They, they, they form a um, intel, a reconnaissance mission. Okay. And they go in and they scout the land out. And they come back and they're like, this place is awesome. I mean, they, and they bring back stuff. They bring back some grapes and stuff like that. They bring back some stuff, and they basically say it really is truly flowing with milk and honey. It is so vast. It is so incredible. Uh, the grapes are hu- everything is so huge. This is this is uh, this is amazing. You know, even the cluster of grapes that they brought back took two men to actually carry them because they were just so plump and so perfect, right? Um, so perfect. And so they come back, and they're they're kind of ecstatic, but. And here we go. But our GPS is saying, take a left. But we're saying, no, we need to take a right. And what happened was they they form, you know, this these 12 men come back, these spies, they come back with this intel. They're uh, in fact, they're uh, they're in there scouting around. Right. They're in there and they're they're gaining all this intel. And Caleb, there's two of them that has a positive report. The other 10 did not. The two that had the positive report were Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb even says this uh, in, in Numbers 13.30. He says this, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. All right? But the other 11 spies, and again, only Joshua and Caleb said, this is what we need to do because this is what God is telling us. Our GPS is saying take a left. God, our God positioning system, is telling us to take a left. We, don't need, we, sh- we can't ignore this. Regardless, we need to go in, we need to take the land. The other 10 said, wait a second, even though it is flowing with milk and honey, even though there are va- it is so vast, it is amazing in there, we cannot pull it off. It's not safe. Because they saw some of the people that lived there and they said they look like, gi- we must look, they look like giants. And then they went on to say, we must look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Okay? And so Moses, you know, so then the other 10 really put the poo-poo on it. They really kind of discourage everybody. And people listen to these two, or these 10 versus the two. Joshua and Caleb, the, Joshua and Caleb say, no, God's telling us to take a left here at uh, Kadesh Barnea. We need to go into the promised land and do what he's instructing us to do, leading us to go here. And the other 10 said, we can't do this because we look like grasshoppers. We must look like grasshoppers in the eyes of these giants. It's not safe. We cannot go in. And so the people listen. Numbers 14 verses 8 and 9 says this, if the Lord is pleased, and this is where Moses gathers people around because he's frustrated. He's the leader of all this. And he knows that they're supposed to take a left and go into the promised land. And he hears the reports and everything as well. And he becomes extremely frustrated because the people are listening to the 10. 
the ten spies that's saying we shouldn't do this, versus Joshua and Caleb that's saying this is where God's leading us, we have to go. And so Moses steps out as the leader and he kind of gives this stump speech. He tries to rally the people around. He tears his clothes. He's frustrated. I mean, he's, his passion is showing. I can get behind that. His passion is really showing. And in Numbers chapter 14, 8 and 9, he says this to the people. He says, If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and He will give it to us. And he goes on to say, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the Lamb because we will devour them. And their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So he gets up and he gives this passionate speech. We got to go in. The Lord is with us. We will devour them. This is where God is leading us. They don't have any protection. We will conquer them. Uh, but we cannot go against what the, what, what the Lord is telling us, what Yahweh is instructing us to do. So how do you think the people felt about Moses' impassioned speech? How do you think they responded to Moses' very passionate speech that he gave? How do you think they responded to them? The person that led them out of slavery, where they were crying, where they were in slavery for 400 years, and God sent them a deliverer by the name of Moses, and Moses literally takes them out of that place. How do you think they responded? Do you think they trusted him? Do you think they listened to him? No, they didn't. Of course, you know the story probably. You know the story. The whole assembly, it says in Numbers 14, verse 10, the whole assembly talked about stoning Moses. They talked about picking up the rocks and just taking Moses out. We don't want to hear it. Isn't it amazing how 10 of these spies came back and said this, and two of them said no, and they listened to the 10, right? And so it's very, it's very interesting how this all played out because, you know, even when Moses stood up and gave that passion speech to say, this is where God is taking us. We saw what God has done. You saw him lead us through, uh, you know, the, the sea, the, you know, and, the, and, and as the sea, as the Egyptians came in after us, he resumed the waters and they all drowned. You know, God is protecting us. God is leading us through this. The Passover, they went through all the plagues. They went through all that stuff, but yet their memory was just like gone. It's like, nope, we can't do this. We can't do this. We can't listen to God. We can't move in. And because of their lack of trust in God, God says, all right, that's fine, but none of you are going to see the promised land except for two, Joshua and Caleb, and some of your kids. But what's interesting is, they say, well, let me just share with you what God does say, uh, specifically in Numbers chapter 14, verses 28 through 34. He says this, so tell them, this is God speaking, so tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do the very thing I heard you say. And this is what the people said, and God is repeating it back to them. He said, I will do everything I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephthah, and Joshua, son of Nun. So what they said was, you know, we can't go in there because our, what about our children? And so they tried to rationalize it. Uh, you, know, you know, what about our children? Our children are not going to, you know, something's going to happen to our children. We need to protect our children. And God says, okay, so none of you, none of you 20 years old or more that was counted in the census We'll get to see the promised land. You're not going to, you're not, it's not going to happen. And he says, I swear by an uplifted hand, this is what's going to take place. And then he goes on to say this, as for your children that you were talking about, as for your children that you said would be taken for as plunder, I will bring them into this land you have rejected. But for you, as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your body lies in the wilderness. For 40 years. Now, why do you pick 40 years? It says it right here in our text. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land. You will suffer for your sins and know what it is like, know what it is like to have me against you. God says, okay, if you don't want to follow me, if you're not going to trust me, you're not going to get to see the blessings. 
Now, what's awesome is that God still took care of them, but they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation died off. One year for every day that the spies were in the land. They were in the land for 40 days, scouting around, getting intel, and coming back with a report. And God said, okay, if that's the way you want it, you will, wandering, you will wander around for, until you die off. One year for every day that they were in the land, scouting around. And your children that you said would be taken for plunder and you should protect, they're the ones that's going to actually get to go in and see the land. So they're the ones that's going to get to go in regardless. Even you, you were trying to protect them from being, uh, being taken as plunder. And so that's what took place. None of them got to see the promised land. They didn't get to see the promise. Now, God took care of them. Um, they, God fed them. God still demonstrated His goodness to them. He protected them. He led them by fire. You know, during the, it's a desert. He, so in the, in the desert, during the day, it gets really super hot. He provided a cloud for them to give them shade. At nighttime, a desert becomes extremely cold. He led them by a pillar of fire. So there was, so there was heat. Um, he fed them. Uh, all they had to do was go out and, and, and take the, just literally, they didn't have to work for the food. All they had to do was go out and pick it up. God fed them. Their shoes and clothes didn't wear out. So God still protected them. But He said, there's no way. You are not going to get to go in and see the promised land. There's no way. It's not going to happen. Your children will, but this generation that is stiff-necked, this generation that's rebelling against me, there's no way. You're not going to get to go in. So their GPS said, take a left at Kadesh Barnea. Remember, he leads them up there. Take a left at Kadesh Barnea. Go into the promised land. But what they did was they said, no, we're going to go against our GPS, our God positioning system. I know I'm riding that illustration out, aren't I? You, instead of listening to, to God here, they took a right and then they went south and went into the wilderness and spent 40 years, 40 years there until that generation died off. Now, interesting story, isn't it? A very interesting story. Again, as we read this story that took place thousands of years ago, we can look at it and say, why didn't they just follow God? Why didn't they just follow their GPS into, into the promised land when they came to Kadesh Barnea? Why didn't they just trust Moses? But let's face it, don't you and I suffer from this same, these same things as well? Don't you and I kind of go against God's leading at times when God wants us to, to turn left and go where, you know, and go into a place that is unknown to us? Um, we look at it and we say, I don't know about that. I don't know if I can follow you there, God. And so we take a right and we go against where God wants and we keep hearing this recalculating, 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 right? <laughs> turn around, do a U-turn, do a U-turn. But we're like, no, and we just shut the GPS off. We shut the Holy Spirit off, right? We, we don't want to hear it because there are some things over here that we deem, uh, whatever it may be, unsafe, whatever it may be, uncomfortable, uh, goes against our preferences, what, I, whatever it is, we say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to take a right and go the opposite direction. And that's what they did. And God said, you're not going to get to receive my blessings. Now, God, again, didn't leave them. He still loved them. He still provided for them but they were not going to get to receive the blessings that God had laid out for them. So as we live in the 21st century, how does that apply to you and I? Well, um, it's kind of, if we could use the whole theme of driving, it's like taking a driver's test, right? Uh, passing our driver's test. The first thing we need to do is we need to learn to ask for directions, okay? We need to learn to ask for directions. Now, I don't know about you, but there's times where it's like, I'm not going to ask for directions, but I tell you what, there's other times for me, I'm done. I don't want to spend more time in the car. I will get out and I will ask for directions because I'm done. I just want to get to where I'm going and I want to get there as quickly as possible because I'm tired and I'm done, right? But we need to ask for directions. Let me tell you, this is a very foundational principle in our Christian life. And what it is, it's discerning the will of God, asking for directions. I'm discerning the will of God. I'm trying to align my story with His story. What's taking place in His meta narrative? Where is it that He's leading me? Can I be a protagonist and not an antagonist like we talked about a few weeks ago? But asking for directions is a very foundational principle in living our Christian life. What is God's will? What is it that God wants me to do? Where is He leading me? What is it that you want me to do, God? What should I do in this situation? How should I make this decision? What steps should I take, right? And, uh, and 
Um, this is, uh, you know, we see this even in Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. And I tried to stress that earlier because that's what we forget. All right? We forget that God is the one that's in charge. God is the one that's driving. Okay? So God is the one that should be driving. Okay? And He says, I am giving these instructions. I am going to do this. You're not, they're not doing it. There's no reason to be full of fear or anything else. I'm doing this. And, and let me just say this. This is, this is how we get direction. This is how we get the will of God. This is how we get the wisdom of God. We spend time in His Word. We spend time reading. We spend time allowing Him to reveal Himself to us. And we get to know God more relationally, not just informationally. And that's what we're trying to do through this whole series uh, of the story, is to know God more relationally not just factually, not just informationally, but we look to His Word to discern His will. You know, one of the pieces that we use, is, use to discern His will, asking for directions. What should I do? And so when we read His Word, we read about marriage. We read about who to marry, right? We read of those things. Who to date? What should we do? You know, should we marry someone outside of our faith? No, God says don't do that because that doesn't end well whatsoever. Okay, so it gives us instructions, His will on marriage. It gives His instruction, His will on how to deal with our finances, how to raise our children. Um, it, gives us, it gives us directions of His will on living our lives with rhythm and balance. For some of us, we have no margins in our lives. We're, so, we're just pushing the margins so far out to the sides. We don't have time for anything. I don't have time to read the Word of God. I don't have time to spend going and worshiping God. I don't have time to be in a small group. I don't have time for that stuff. Why? Because I'm not really discerning God's will. I'm discerning Gail's will. I'm discerning my will and what I want to do. And the first thing we need to do, if we're ever going to pass this driver's test, again, just using that as, an, as our illustration, we need to ask for directions, okay? And it's all in there. Whatever it is that we're experiencing in our lives, God will discern His will to us. The question becomes, will you listen? Will we follow His will? Or will we become like one of these individuals and say, no, I'm going to go my own way. And then we miss out on God's blessings. God doesn't leave us. God doesn't just leave us to hang. But we certainly don't get to experience the blessings that He wants to give us so passionately and desperately. The second thing is this, don't be driven by fear. Like these guys, don't be driven by fear. You know, they're, they're like, you know, the, the reason why they didn't go in, because they were afraid. We saw these people, they look like giants. We, we must look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Numbers 14, 9, and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. That's what Moses' speech was about. Don't fear them. We will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm just going to be honest, and you are in the same way. I know you are because you're a human as well. There are times when I don't have the answer. I don't deal with that well at all. The stress of that, the fear of it, the unknown, and you begin to speculate. I get it. I understand. I get that you're the same way. There's times where you do it in your life, and sometimes we allow that to overcome or to crowd out the will of God within our lives. God says, I'm doing this. Clear back in Genesis 12, when He makes that first covenant, that promise to Abraham, it's I. I'm doing this. I, 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 I. You'll be involved. You're going to be a character in this story. You're going to play a role in this story. But at the end of the day, I'm doing this. I'm leading you. I'm taking you into this place. I'm doing this, right? I, God keeps saying it, I. You know, and again, Moses saying, God is the one, right? Don't be afraid of the people. Don't be afraid of the people of that land. We're going to devour them because their protection is gone. But the Lord, Yahweh, is with us. Do we not remember Yahweh? Again, back to the plagues, back to the crossing of the sea, um, all these other things where they saw God displaying His power over and over and over again. Don't forget uh, the Lord, Yahweh Himself, is with us. So the first thing is discern God's will. Ask for directions if we're going to pass this test and not go the wrong way, not take a right turn at Kadesh, uh, Kadesh Barnea, 
but instead take a left-hand turn like he's telling us to do. Um, how, don't be afraid or don't uh, ask for directions. And the second thing is don't, be, don't allow fear to overcome you. Don't be driven by fear. And then the last thing is this. Remember, others are in the car with you. What you think you're doing can affect your whole family. What you think you're doing, the consequences that God may lay out because of your fear may affect just more than you. Typically it does. It's not just about you, but it's affecting more people. There's other people in the car, i.e. your family. How are you leading your family? Okay? God laid down the consequences for their failure to move into the land, and He says this in chapter 14, verse 33 of Numbers. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years. So yeah, they're going to be stuck here with you for 40 years until you die off. I'm adding that part. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. So you're so worried about them taking your children as plunder, you failed to realize that by you not going into the promised land, you not taking the left-hand turn at Kadesh Barnea, that you're actually putting your children in much graver danger because now they're going to have to spend 40 years here because of your unfaithfulness. So remember, guys, there are more people in this. Our decisions don't just affect us, but they affect others around us. They affect everybody in the same car with us. Just, again, using that illustration. As we drive, we affect everybody. And what's interesting, the last time under, the last time under the leadership of Moses, he sent in 12 spies. God told him to send in 12 spies. Two of those came back with a positive report. Ten of them said, we can't go in. The second time when all of the... When all of the... Um, uh, that generation dies off. Do you know how many people went in to take a look? Two. That's it. Two. Right? And they came back and they said the land is still flowing with milk and honey. There are more people there than ever than there were 40 years ago, of course. And they said the Jericho Heights must be putting risers in their shoes because they look bigger than their parents, right? Um, yes, it'll be dangerous, but God is with us. And again, we're just kind of paraphrasing what's, you know, what God was saying. But that's the difference. And I want to tell you something. Sometimes... Sometimes the majority doesn't have it right. Sometimes when we say, well, we'll go along with the majority, you might want to be careful because it's not really about the number. It's not about following the committee. It's not really following about the team that's lead. It's about God, Yahweh leading us. What is the will of, God, of Yahweh? What is the will of our Lord? Are we going to follow Him or are we going to follow the majority? Because sometimes the majority is off. And that's what we see right here. And the next time they went in, only two went in and they came back and they said, yep, it's still there. However, there's a lot more people there now. Uh, they even look bigger. And it's kind of interesting as you think, well, if we wouldn't have went back here, it might've been a little bit easier, right? Uh, now we got to deal with something even much grander. They're still dangerous and all this stuff. It's going to be dangerous. And, and no one's saying, uh, I think sometimes when we discern God's will and we say, we're going to go here, people think you've lost your mind. And they just, they just kind of, uh, they just, you know, it's just like, no, we st no, it's still going to be dangerous. No one said it's not going to be dangerous. It's still going to be dangerous, but the difference is we're going to trust God this time. We're going to certainly trust God because He's the one that's leading us. He's the one that's saying we need to go in and take over. This is the promise that He is giving us. And if we would have taken a left back here, we would have already been engaged in uh, uh, receiving the blessings of this land. But no, we took a right and we had to, we had to uh, deal with this. Uh, sidebar over here for 40 years and, 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 and now, we're, now we're going to go in and discover His will and live in the center of God's will. So it is for our lives. Again, discern God's will. Ask for directions. The Bible clearly tells us, follow those directions. Don't take a right. Take a left. Go in. Go into the promised land when you arrive at Kadesh Barnea, whether it's over marriage, your finances, whether it's over how to deal with raising your kids, uh, the rhythms and balances of your life, um, all whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, God's directions are there for us uh, so that we can follow Him, right? Don't be driven by fear and then realize that there are other people in the car with you. Your decisions, your fear not only affects you, but it affects those around you. And why do you want to put that on your family? Break the curse and follow the leading of Yahweh. I hope you have a great week. Spend some time uh, just thinking about this. Uh, spend some time thinking about your GPS. And when God tells you to take a left, or you, when you arrive at Kadesh Barnea, 
what is it you're going to do? Take a left or turn right and wander around the wilderness. I hope you have a great week. Thank you.